Shalom, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Beit Tehillah Community Podcast. We believe the Torah is relevant for our lives today, God's teachings and instructions. You may very well be part of the first generation to be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, and have the Torah, a Christian with Torah. Join us as we honor the living God through the study of His Word, topical conversations, and interviews with special guests. Please welcome our hosts, Pastor Nick Plummer and Ryan Cabrera. Shalom, everybody, and welcome to Christians with Torah, the Beit Tehillah Community Podcast. I'm your co-host, Ryan Cabrera, and I'm in Studio B with Pastor Nick Plummer. Hey, Pastor Nick. Hello, hello, shalom. Oh, man, thank you guys so much for joining us, Christians with Torah. Gosh, That's right. We're, we're so passionate about Torah that we're reading the New Testament. That's right. You know why? Because today we're going to talk about how the Torah is relevant for today, but you're not going to get good. that See? until you, unless you stick around till the good. end. So That's today good. you have to stick around. It just That's is good. what it is. But first, we're going to give you an announcement. The first announcement, I believe we have uh, November 22nd, Mr. Avi Lipkin is going to be visiting us again. And so you guys may have seen him on the podcast. Right. Uh, a little bit of a controversial podcast, you know, on that one. Yeah, sure. You know, he uh, he's a very passionate man. That's right. And uh, But he has been a friend of Beit Tehillah for over 20 years, so we're excited to have him coming back. And uh, this week, we're studying uh, the book of Matthew again, and we're moving into chapter 5. Uh, you can go back. We have four four years worth of going through the Torah portion. So if you want to find the weekly Torah portion, just go and you can find on our thing. Yeah, refresh your four uh, memory. That's right. different episodes That's of the right. same portion. That's true. Which means I might have said the same thing over and over. I might have said something different. But, yeah, that's, you know. Uh that's good. It is It is what it is. So today we're doing chapter five, but as you can imagine, chapter five of the book of Matthew is packed with all kinds of good stuff. And so what we did is we said, you know what, we're going to just bite off a little bit at a time. Yeah. And so today we're going to do verses one through 20. That's it. The gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter five, verses one through 20. Once again, the gospel of Matthew proves and shows us the theme is that Jesus is king. Right. It's a, it's a, it's a king and yeah. we're his subjects. So that's, uh, that's uh, really cool. Uh, so who was present when Yeshua went up into a mountain to teach? He went up to teach, and they, he said the multitudes and his disciples. That's right. So he's going to go up into the mountain to teach. Yeah. So he'll get up on the mountain. It might be down below. He'll speak. The air, the wind will carry it. It's like a mul- like the a, multitudes and the disciples. Like an amphitheater right. deal. Okay. So this is called the Beatitudes. And so uh, the Beatitudes are verses 1 through 12. We're just going to jump right into the Beatitudes because there's so many to cover here. Uh, It says right here, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yes. That's how he starts it off. See, I don't like that one. Um, So real quick, though, before we jump into all of that, Beatitude. What is a Beatitude? What does that even mean? That's a good word. It, It is. It means supreme blessedness supreme blessedness um and so it's uh it's a word that that says in, used a lot of times in religious contexts um it's also a title given to patriarchs in the orthodox church so they could say his beatitude or your beatitude but it's a supreme blessedness and so it's called the beatitude it's kind of an old king james word but we've kept it as a as a description of this sermon on the mount you know section right wow and so we're going to get into some dark sayings, right? Some hard sayings, some things that... Yeah, it's interesting. I don't you know, really get it. So you said you know, it, right? Yeah, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, when we are weak, he is strong. That's right. You could go off and branch off into a lot of things. This particular word means to crouch, beggar. Uh, actually, it comes from a word uh, to become indigent, uh, and then a pauper. Now... The poor were those who cried out for God's help, de- depended entirely on him for their needs, had a humble and contrite spirit, experienced his deliverance, and enjoyed his undeserved favor. Yeah. Now, this would be the opposite of entitlement. I just, I don't like it. I mean, the poor in spirit, poor, I mean, it just doesn't sound like a... Well, I think, you know, because these things are be broken. Supreme blessedness, right? You, you know, you have a spirit, but blessed are the poor in spirit. Maybe yeah. it's not a haughty spirit. Right, right, Look for right. some antonyms, synonyms. Yeah, kind of thing. yeah, yeah. I got gotcha. you. So, so blessed are the, you, you know, the humble. Right. The humble in yeah. spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, yeah. it's interesting. You know, we we can use power and position, but blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, and that word once again means that the connotation is that you're not coming across as brash or, 
you know, uh, belligerent or whatever, but you're, you're poor in spirit. So somebody that's poor in spirit is not self-seeking maybe? That's, that's a good thing. Right. Yeah. Um, they're... They haven't arrived. Right, you know? right. They're like dependent upon God. Right. They don't measure themselves on their finances or so all these other maybe things. maybe maybe just maybe we're all poor in spirit, but some of us don't realize it, and so maybe this is the kingdom of heaven is for those that recognize that they're poor in spirit and they're in need of a savior. You know that's the thing. Are we in need of a savior? Right. So if you're poor in spirit, you, the, you, you're at least in, recognize you're in need. it. Yeah. So now now. Here's the thing, that's the kingdom of God, because it says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, yeah. or the kingdom of God, which is synonymous. Right. I'm just saying that if you're poor in spirit, you're like, hey, I'm in the kingdom, I need the king. Right, I him, right. I don't need the government. Mm. You know, I don't need a mandate. <laughs> <laughs> so blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Matthew 5, 4, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. This beatitude can be found in the context of Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. It portrays mourning as expressive of Israel's sorrow over the exile which their sins had caused. It expresses the grief of those suffering the consequences of sin. Yeah. You want to read Isaiah 61? I, you know, I'm so glad Which you asked me because I was going to, but then I was like, I don't know. Yeah, you know, we got time for that, definitely. We got, we got time for that. So, um, you know, if you listen to the interview I just did with Tommy Waller, I talk about how we were on the mountain. And uh, an Orthodox rabbi is standing up there with us, and he busts out with this, right? We're standing there. Yeah, he told me. And what an, I mean, all of us Christians are looking around like, does he know what he's doing? So anyway, so this is what he read. He read this. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Hallelujah. So that's that's a picture of the Messiah, right? Right. But is that also a picture of the people that give that hope? I would Messiah, say so. I would say so. But it's the Messiah. Well, you got to think that we're supposed to be acting like Messiah, right? So then, you know, he leaves and gives us the Holy Spirit so then we can continue to fulfill the mandate, there's your word mandate again, of his work, things that he was doing. So we're then going forward as little Christs spread throughout the world to be his hands and feet in the world. So why wouldn't we be doing these things, right? And the Bible says that he catches our tears. Well, we should be preaching good tidings to the poor. He measures right? our tears in a, 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 a jar or a bottle. We he should bottles be up our tears. healing the brokenhearted, right. proclaiming liberty to the captives, opening the prison doors to That's those good. that are bound. So blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, uh, This also applies to those who have suffered loss or those that are down and out. So check this out. If we take the same logic, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Why are they blessed? Because they're comforted. Maybe we can go back to our first one and say, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why are they blessed? Because they have the kingdom of heaven. Right? Just kind of yeah, it makes it sense. Back. Yeah, it's like a cause So how do, how do we measure things? Right. So if you're in the kingdom of God, you're going to turn the other cheek. If you're in the kingdom of God, you're going to give your cloak and your shirt off. So if you're in the kingdom of God, you're going to go another mile instead of two or one. Look go at next you. Mile. I'm just saying that it's a game changer. Sure is. Because now you're in the kingdom of God. Yeah. You know. And if God was fair, none of us would be here. That's what somebody had said. Oh, boy, ain't that the truth? I wouldn't be here. If he was a fair God. <laughs> I would have been zapped a long time you know, ago. Even even grading on the curve. Uh, so those are two great beatitudes, you know. Uh, boy, there's a lot of humility there. There's a lot of unselfishness there. Right. Honesty, transparency yep. in the beatitudes. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot, a lot of transparency. So what do you got for me, Matthew 5, 5, Ryan? You can take over here. All right, so it's blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Wow. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. That's humility. You know what was interesting about blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth? Uh, at first, I was like, inherit the earth? Like, who wants that? You know, because we think as Christians about the world and the worldly system right. and all that. Um, but then, uh, you know, we were talking in our group last night, and we were kind of discussing the meek being the humble, right? Because uh, meek doesn't necessarily mean weak. Uh, a lot of times it means strength under control. Someone that's meek is submitted, right? So you can have 
all of this strength and capability, but you're submitted to God. And so that would be a meek person, someone who's humble. But then shall inherit the earth, I believe, is, is those who are humble shall be exalted, right? So you get favor in this life, on this side of eternity, when you are humble, I thought that was a pretty cool idea. And so it says here, Isaiah 61 verse 7 uses the words, they shall inherit the earth, an exact parallel to Matthew 5, 5. The first three Beatitudes thus confirm Yeshua's identity as the servant of Isaiah 61. So, wow. And he's doing the teaching, right, um, here, and then you find it in the prophecies. So it's it's cool because, you know, Jesus didn't necessarily come to... Uh, bring a bunch of new things. He came to bring light and maturity to the things that God has already given us. You know, it means to be to be humble, mild, or gentle. Yes, that's one of the fruits of the spirit is gentleness. It is. Have wow. you ever heard the term "gentle giant"? Wow. You know, because somebody that's a, you think giant, you think somebody that's big and strong. You know, that has the ability to crush you like bug. Right. But doesn't. Wow. You know, somebody that, that cares for others. And so the meek are those who trust God and surrender to his authority, even when they cannot make sense of their circumstances. That means sovereignty kicks in then. Man. You're so humble that you can receive God's sovereignty. Yep. It's like, why did this happen to me? Why was my husband taken by COVID? Right. The other person's husband wasn't taken. Right. No, those are tough. Why does he live, but my husband didn't? Right. You know, um, think about that. You know, the meek shall inherit the earth. It, it reminds me of when Yeshua is teaching the disciples, and he says that the first will be last, and the last will be first. And so these these people that are are humble and are not again self seeking, you know, not seeking after you know selfish ambition and gain, uh, but instead are putting others before themselves and helping others and being the servant, as you mentioned from Isaiah sixty one. Those people. Yeah will receive favor in this life because the blessing is intrinsic sometimes, you know? Interesting. So I was just cool. looking at this. Uh, I'm just thinking uh, Isaiah 61, 7. Right. I'm just trying to figure that out here. What, instead of your shame, you should have it, double honor? It says, for your shame... You shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land they shall possess the double everlasting joy shall be unto them. Wow. So that goes along with what I was saying about inheriting the earth. Get a double portion. The portion, therefore, in their land. Right. Gotcha. Wow. It's more personable in this one. Oh, absolutely, yeah. The land. Yeah. Wow. It says right, therefore, in their land, yeah, they shall possess Yeah, I, I was making sure because I was doing some studying and I wanted to pull out some little nuggets there to reflect on some things because we want to try to find the Old Testament and the New Testament. Right, right. What, what do they say? What's that saying? The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is the New Testament the, revealed. Right, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Did I say it right? I'm not sure. Okay, we're not going to edit. <laughs> so, you know, humility is a good thing, you know. And I think when we're transparent and honest, you know, um, you know that that is such a good thing, you know. Yeah. All right, let's continue on. All right, so number five here. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You know, I would like to say that... Uh, and you can read those bullet points, Ryan. But I, I would say this, though. When I look at that, mm-hmm. and I had to paraphrase it, or how how could I get anything out of that? I would say that uh, every day that you wake up, you want to do what is right. Yeah. So you're like, you want to make good decisions. You want to do the right thing. Right. You know, now you know, we're not perfect, but we say to ourselves, hey, I want to I do the right thing. Yeah. You know. Well, and, and so yeah. I mean, I think about um, the definition of righteousness, like what is righteousness? And at, the, at its core, I believe righteousness is right standing with God. Um, it is the, the status, a righteous or righteousness is the status of being, right, at right standing with God, being right with God. 
there's only one way to be right with God, and that's through Yeshua. And so that's why it says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ, because we're in Christ. And Abraham's belief was accounted to him as righteousness, righteousness. right? So that seed of faith. So, um, you know, let me just read through these bullet points real quick. It says, hunger and thirst are metaphors for a disciple's fervent desire for righteousness. So you're hungering and thirsting, which I think people get that. The words, they shall be filled, are in the passive voice, indicating that righteousness is not something that disciples can achieve by their own efforts. So it's almost like you get an A for effort. It's not about how well you did. It's about the heart behind it. That's right. It says, they shall be filled with the Holy Spirit and know what is right. You know, um, I think about King David, and so a lot of people... Um, you talk about King David and the greatness of King David, and there's also a lot of talk about the the great failures of King right. David. But that G- King David, even though he had these great failures, that he was still a man after God's own heart, right? Yeah, what does God want through me? Right. So, well, that's a powerful thing, Ryan. It really is. If everybody just stops and we say, and I've, and I've said it, I'm saying it, I know you are, I just, I just you know, Lord, what's your heart? Amen. You know, and that's why we, we stress the Jewish people, the state of Israel, you know, because that's his heart. Yeah. You know, and, and it, God's got a plan and he wants you to participate. You know, this next one, blessed are the merciful, right? For they shall obtain mercy. I understand this one. Good. I get, so like, you remember I said the other ones, there's some, so there's some tough sayings here. Right. But I feel like I get this one. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Uh, because it's almost like a what what you sow is what you reap. You reap what you sow. Right. So I, I understand that one. So the merciful are characterized by a caring attitude for those who are in misery, for those who are in misery. Yeah. So we um, don't say, "Oh, look, they made their bed. Let them lay in it." Yeah. I wash my hands of that. Yeah. Those kind of things. Right. Right. I I find that difficult sometimes. You know, as a pastor, people make bad decisions, but I don't look down on them. I'm like, you know, I've made bad decisions. Yeah. <laughs> but how are you going to treat them? Right. We should treat them with mercy. Yeah. Okay, they they dropped the ball, they messed up. Right. But I'm going to be there for them. Yeah, yeah, of course. And and move on. No, of course. And you know, sometimes the consequences that they're facing are 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 worse than anything you could give them, you know, through judgment, right? What are you going to do? Just now you have to look down right. upon them. They're right. already facing consequences, you know. So the word merciful is the Strong's Greek 1655, which is didn't you you looked it up, right? Oh, ele emon. Ele emon. Means compassionate, involving thought and action. That's right. See, you can be merciful, but are you showing mercy as an action? Yeah. You know, like somebody messes up, you know, are you there to help them? Now, this next bullet point I've been big on lately. I've been talking about this a lot, right? Because it's Psalm 136. I, I thought there's no better bullet point than that. His mercy endureth forever. Why don't you open up that psalm and just read a few verses? I can read a few verses. Because every yeah. verse says that. It does, right. But here's here's the thing. We're, I'm going to read a few verses and then I want to I want to get into something real quick because it really is awesome. It says here, "Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever." Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him alone does great wonders. For his mercy endures forever. To him who by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endures forever. And it does that through, you know, what is it, 26 verses? Yeah, 26 verses. So I like this one, verse 25. Who giveth food to all flesh, for his mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, you know, it's, it, 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 he could not do Oh, wait, that. wait, wait. I want verse 24 right now for uh, me. Go ahead. And hath redeemed us from our enemies for his mercy endureth forever. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Thank you. You will, you will redeem me from my enemies. All right, so wow. the Greek word in, in the Beatitudes is the word ele emon, right? It sounds French. Ele emon. Ah, but of course, oh, ele emon. <laughs> <laughs> but the word in, in uh, Psalm 136 is what? Did you say hesed? It is hesed. Oh, it is okay. hesed. Right. Ding, 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 ding. I was paying attention. Listen, this is good stuff. Hesed. Okay. So, 
I feel like I've been listening to some stuff. Uh, Michael Heiser did a whole podcast on a word study of the word hesed. You have mentioned it from his book, What Does God Want? Right. Um, and he wrote about it in another book where he kind of like really extrapolates on it. But he did just on the word hesed a whole like hour podcast, and I listened to it. And you sent it to me. I did. Have you listened to it yet? No. No. I'm in Revelation 21, 22, finishing that up. But there's a lot. Of good I did stuff notice to he had to. the Revelation ones. I haven't even dipped into that. I started the first one where he talks about what he's going to talk about. It's really good. It is. I can tell. Um, anyway, so the word Hesed is a is a Hebrew word that has uh, kind of a deeper meaning. Kind of like the word Shalom. It me- it doesn't just mean peace, right? It has has kind of like a, a deeper meaning to it. Well, Hesed a lot of times is translated as mercy, like it is in Psalm 136, but is also translated in Hosea as loving kindness, and it's translated in other places as kindness just by itself. But Michael Heiser makes the argument that it really has a deeper meaning, which means believing loyalty or loving loyalty. That it is a word that is not necessarily just spontaneous, but that it is dependent on the actions of another, right? So. Yeah. Uh, and that there's a built-in reciprocity built in, right? So like the, and you can almost boil this down that the, what is the the characteristic of the saved person, the person that has salvation? Right. And you could say that it's hesed. Why? Because it's the believing loyalty. It's not just that you believe, it's that you've now also kind of committed some sort of allegiance. There's a response to the to the greater. Correct. Good or the greater God, and we're right. the lesser people. Correct. There's, we respond accordingly. Right. Yeah. So then this, this believing loyalty we have with God, you think about Abraham, right? What is the characteristic the Jewish rabbis talk about, about Abraham and about Moses, about all these people? It's hesed. They talk about this. And how having this characteristic is a defining factor in, uh, of them, right? It's it's one of their defining characteristics, and that it is the thing. And so I was just talking about King David, right? How is it that King David does all of these things, but then yet is still called a man after God's own heart? Well, look and find me an example where he turned away from God and went and served other gods. Was he ever disloyal to God? Did he ever turn towards you know pagan idolatry or anything like that? I don't I don't believe he did, right? I see what you're saying. Now. Uh, it doesn't mean that his actions went without consequences, right? All the blood that he shed and all of those things, God said, you're not going to build my house with the blood on your hands. He says, right. I'm going to let that happen you know, from your next generation. But I think this word has said is the characteristic that we should all be striving for, where there's a key loyalty in it, right? When That's Abraham right. believed God, he didn't just believe God, he believed God with a measure of loyalty because of the covenant, right? That's it. So could God have promised him that, hey, your descendants are going to be like the sand on the seashore and the stars in the heaven? but then not circumcised himself? No, there had to be a sign. No, he had to, he, it, 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 the person in that position that has the characteristic of Hesed, it's not gonna be a question of whether or not they should actually go through with the circumcision, right? That's an obvious thing. He has the believing loyalty, that's why the sign is created. That's right. So. I mean, you know, it, it's so, so if you have Hesed, yeah. you'll get. And God shows mercy to him, he wants to show hesed. mercy to. Right. Uh, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew five eight. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Clean hands and a pure heart. Amen. Give us clean hands. Give us a pure heart. The pure in heart are those whose pursuit of purity and uprightness affects every area of life. They shall see God. Yeah. You know, so God wouldn't ask us to be holy unless we could be holy. Right. And God's very nature and being is pure. Pure. Yep. So remember, from him all things come. Who made God? God. From him all things come. And he is a holy God. He is pure. He is righteous. And so he has that attribute. So he wants us to walk in like manner. But though a righteous man falls seven times, he can still arise. I mean, there's all these sayings, and according to our free will, how, you know, the evil inclination, you know, uh, there's no one that is righteous, no, not one. There's no one that seeks after God, no, not one. That's in the context of being a God or being God. But it's like, here we are, we're his his creation, but God's very nature and being is pure. So what's the what's the opposite of pure? The opposite is... Impure. Impure. Or polluted. Right. Or tainted. It's a state of being, like right. clean or unclean. And so we think it's of... state. I think a lot of times we think of the innocence of a child, but I think that we receive a purity through Messiah. And that um, little by little, you know, like at first, you know, you're you're breaking off the, the layers of the onion. Right. 
And so at first it's, you know, you, you quit smoking, drinking, and hanging out with yeah, people layers. that do, right? And then the next layer has, you know, every deeper layer gets deeper into your mind, your will, and your emotions, and you start working on the sin that's that's built inside of your soul, which actually I would say that once we get past verse 20, which we're not going to cover anything past verse 20 today, that's what Yeshua starts dealing with. He breaks off the layer and yeah, goes deeper. Yeah, I think deeper. so. Yeah. It's pretty powerful. It is. And like gold, right? Pure I mean, gold is yeah, more I mean, valuable it's, it's, than... It's, and so as we move towards uh, uh, Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for these shall be called the children of God. Uh, the Blue Letter Bible, BLB app, I encourage everyone to get it. It's awesome. Because now I'm going to do the word that's going to be given for peacemakers in the Greek. It means pacificatory, or like a pacifist, or peaceable. Um and this is, of course, the word, and we'll, we'll, we'll play it up loud here, uh, for the, the word for peacemakers. Strong's G, 1518, I wow, wasn't going to get that that's one. That's a tough one. <laughs> Arreno poyas. Poyas, yeah. Poyas. Yeah, it's like a Y. Arreno poyas. So it, tells, it teaches you how to, to pronounce it. You know, as you look up these words, this is a good time to look up these Greek words in the Beatitudes. It, it is, you and I'll know? tell you what, even like the English words, like pacificatory or pacificatory. Pacific, that's a big, big yeah. verbiage, big words. That's an SAT word there, buddy. I don't know. Yeah, we need to look that one up. Pacificatory. Yeah. Pacific, <laughs> pac- I don't know. <laughs> I know. That's what I was Pacific- saying. When I put this on here, I just love you guys just trying to, we're just going to go on to the next word. <laughs> we're going to go on to the next beatitude. Next. So, so think about it, you know, um, you know. I've learned as a pastor, even even with with situations and with relationships, that you know, if you're a peacemaker, you can you can you can resolve any difference. Yeah. To I think a good conclusion, I would think so. You know, um, I'm not quick to throw anybody out of here, or I, I'm not quick to want anybody to leave. I would like for them to say, hey, you know, God's called me here, but I'm having a circumstance, or I'm in a situation, or a relationship, or sure. the leadership, or the church, or whatever. But I would like to resolve it. I want to. I want to make it right. And I think that's our responsibility as leaders to initiate that as a peacemaker. Yeah. Hey, let me hear. Let me hear your beef. What's wrong? What's going on here? You know, we love each other enough to know in the body of Christ that you're my brother. You're my sister. Let's let's reason. Let's work this out. Let's figure this out. Yeah. You know? And I think that's what a peacemaker is. Yes. You know, it's not being judgmental. It's being a peacemaker. God's a peacemaker. Come, and let that, us reason and, together. And, and being peaceable. And, and, and God gives us all the instructions on how to do it. When you're offended, you go to your brother and all these other things, you know. Yeah. Um, don't hate your brother, you know, and all that. So uh, they shall be called children of God, you know. Yeah. And I like that. You know, there's not, there's not a lot of peacemakers. Yeah. Well, you know? I, I mean, I know of one son of God and how through his work he made peace for all of us. He is a peacemaker. He is, and he gives us his peace, not as the world gives, but as he gives. Amen. Um, I'm going to let you take it over from here in Matthew 5.10. So this is, um, yeah, Matthew 5.10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Now this is interesting because this parallels the first beatitude, which is blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Right? So it, it's, it's, it's a so parallel. So the kingdom, yeah. In both sides. Christian, my son told me that this is I'm not I don't know what it's called it's not acrostic it's where like it goes like from the outside in and then like it meets in the middle and then like everything's pointing into the middle and I'm like how is my 12 year old telling me <laughs> this oh there's a uh, there's a pattern here there's Dad. a pattern here you know and what's interesting is then when you put at the middle are the the two are blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled and blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy so you put those at kind of like the centerpiece of this you know wow and, and if you added the one more, which is the verse 11, because you can kind of add that one into this, then the blessed are those, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. That becomes the centerpiece of all of this, which is what I was talking about with Hesed, but you know. But because of these attributes of the Beatitudes, right. this is what's going to happen at the end. Well, and these are You're things. You're going to be persecuted. These are things that you want to strive for, but the unfortunate thing is that in this world, the world almost can't handle it. Right. What does it say here? So it says, We are persecuted for the righteousness of Yeshua, which gives us justification because of his death on the cross. So see, it's really what he has done, not what we have done. Right. It's what he has done to bring on the persecution. That's right. Right, right. And Which and, is powerful because there's no, you're not attributing anything to yourself. You're, you're living through him 
right. what he has done. Amen. Because what would the Holy Spirit do but convict the world of sin, righteousness, right. and judgment? Amen. So there's sin. So Jesus came for sin. Yep. And then the righteousness that he did what he had to do, and he went back to the right hand of the Father. Right. So he did it. Yes. And then, of course, the rule of this world has been judged. That's it in a nutshell. That's that's the whole encompassing plan right there. Yeah. Jesus came. He accomplished it. He went to the Father, and now the devil's done. Yeah. Because of him. Amen. So we live through him, and then we get all these other things happening to us because Amen. of him. Right. Which is pretty cool, if you ask me, because he did all the work. Well, and, and the point is that all of this points to him. Right. Which is cool. So uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and, say, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Man. So I guess our discussion question is for us to think of ways that you personally have been persecuted for your faith. You know, it's interesting, you know, Yeshua told me a long time ago, let the critics come to you. Yeah. Don't go to the critics. Yeah. Um, you know, and I would say this, Ryan, in, in this context of this discussion, I would say this as a pastor and as a son of God, I would definitely say this. Don't push your faith on others. Mm. You know, Yeshua says, let them see your light. We're going to get into that. Yeah. Let them, you know, see that you have, you know, some flavor. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So my thing is, you know, if they're going to come after us, let them come after us because we are practicing our faith, right. not pushing our faith on others. Right. We're, we're living our faith. Then let them persecute us. Yes. Because then it's rightly, then it's rightly so because that's my faith. Right. So if you're going to persecute me, that's okay because this is what I believe. This is who I am. You know, real quickly here, Ryan, I just want to say one thought and then you can jump in here. I just want to make it clear. It's very interesting just just what came to my mind. And I want to just go to Romans real quick here and show you some interesting uh, points because here's what's happening right now. For those of you that are listening or watching, uh, there's an incredible thing about you know wild branches being grafted into the olive tree. Yeah. And the root is Yeshua. And there's natural branches and unnatural branches. Because of their unbelief, the natural branches, we were grafted in. But how great will that day be when they're grafted back in? Now, what I want to bring about is this, Ryan, in the fact of the Hebrews of the Christian faith of this movement, of the restoration, regather the whole house of Israel. It says this, though. It says this is, the, this is what's very interesting. Um, just so you know, these few verses here in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 28. Um, for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Mm. This goes back to the Phrium. The Gentiles are coming into the Hebrews of the Christian faith, yeah. provoking the Jews the jealousy. They're coming in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Mm -hmm. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Now, verse 28 is very interesting. Well, look at us now. We're in the Hebrews of the Christian faith movement. We're Christians with Torah. Listen right. to this verse. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. So because of this gospel of Jesus Christ... We're the enemies of the Jewish people. Well, and the next words are, for the gifts and calling of God are without Irre repentance. Irrevocable. Right. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that this is what's happening with, with being persecuted. Yeah. Well, this is, well, you believe Jesus is the Messiah. We don't. Yeah. So that's why some of the Jews are a little hesitant on building a relationship because we worship the Godhead, supposedly, three gods or whatever. We have the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you can see the differences now and why they would come after our own faith or belief because of that. Yeah. But there are those that have a mutual respect towards Christianity and, and us towards Judaism, which is what we're doing. Yeah. I so think anyway. I think one of the keys here that Yeshua says is that, that they shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. Right? So the key is that we're not doing all manner of evil because Yeshua has a higher standard that's above reproach. It's it's above whatever other standard has been set in the past. And we're going to actually talk about that that you know closer to Attributing the end. the works of of God to the devil. Right. That's false. Right. That's the only unpardonable sin. Right. But think of it this way, right? against the Holy Spirit. We here in America are not 
even close to being truly persecuted. And I, I unfortunately say the word yet at the end of that statement. No, we're not. There's but, no way. You know, even even Rodney Howard Brown, when he got arrested for keeping his church open, right? It was right. big national news and all this. Um, I heard him speaking about it. And even he was talking about, like, you know, they brought this nice SUV to pick him up and arrest him, right? And so yeah. he's riding in this SUV that's pretty nice. And then he gets there to the station, and they put him in a cell that was clean. He had a cot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Had everything he needed. They, you know, And he's from South Africa, so I, I'm sure he's... Well, and so the point being, like, this is being in prison for Jesus. Like, this is as hard as it gets. He's like, this isn't, you know, we have no idea how difficult it can be or will be right. um, in the future when we experience real persecution. Right. And so the point is made, and I think he made a good point in this, is that if we can't stand up now, we have no hope of standing up when real persecution happens. Well, where's the happens. church's faith, Ryan? Right. Where's our faith? Right. Do we believe in prayer? Do we believe in worship? Yeah. Do we believe in God's word? See, yeah. we're being overstimulated. I agree. So I agree. let's let's move into uh, if you want to read, let's read Matthew five verses thirteen through sixteen. Now he's going to go into the after the Beatitudes, he's going to go into hey, your salt and your light. I love this. Um, this is these are great verses um, for believers today. Just based on what we were just talking about with the being persecuted. It's funny how he kind of knows what he's doing, you know? It's like he he knows. It's good. It is. Because now you're going to be influencing the world. That's right. So it says here, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So he goes from the Beatitudes to salt and light. So you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You know, I love all the different kinds of salts. <laughs> We have Dead Sea salt. Yeah. From the Dead Sea. That's right. And they throw in like rosemary. Uh huh. Or thyme yep. or I've had it, yep. And you, you know, yeah. you're not a true Israelite until you have the Dead Sea salt. Yeah. So it's interesting how, you know, you don't just want table salt, bleach salt, or whatever it's called, or, yeah. or salt without iodine or whatever. You don't yeah. just, you want to get some well, fancy salt. It's the sea salt. salt that's without the what iodine. What about the, uh, the Celtic salt. sea salt? Oh, or the pink Himalayan sea salt. Himalayan sea salt. Yeah. See, that savor, it's got, oh, yeah, put a little bit of that on there. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's how God wants us to be. Right. Bam, you know, like emerald. Well, we gotta, he wants some flavor. But what is the purpose of salt in food other than just, uh, from a culinary standpoint, from a flavor standpoint, it enhances the flavor of whatever right. is on it, right? And so, um, you know, with out the flavor, there really is no point to the salt. And I think that's what he's saying here, that we don't want to be watering down the gospel, the message of Jesus, yeah, or anything like it that. It says, salt is beneficial as a preservative for seasoning, etc. So are disciples of Yeshua who influence the world for good. But, you know, we, we see church should be like Baskin Robbins. There should be a lot of flavors. Yeah. See, every one of us is like a flavor. Yeah, but why you got to be so salty? You know, people have a, <laughs> yeah, yeah, why do you be so salty? <laughs> you know what the Lord was showing me? Are you ready for this? I'm ready. When I was reading this some time ago, he said, you know, when you are the salt of the earth, when you when you have that savor, you know, that, that flavor, yeah. and you go out into the world, the, the world is an open wound. People Oof, have open wounds. That's right. And when you brush up against them, the salt goes into their wounds. It makes Man. them cry out. Yeah, yeah. Ouch. That's why they'll snap at you or do things, you know. That's right. Because they sense, they know, yeah. see. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, my thing is, you know, uh, matter of fact, one of the punishments that, that is in the Torah that God said would happen to the land of Israel, that the, the land would be salted. Right, so that nothing would grow. Nothing would grow. Now, now I didn't discover that until just maybe a year ago, two years ago. Yeah. The Romans did that. Yes. So I'm like, how do you even come up with that? It's going to get so bad, I'm going to salt your land. Check this out. They taxed the landowners by the number of trees on their land. So by, what they did is the landowners themselves demolished the trees on their know, own land. I know. You know, out of spite. Out of spite. It's like the Democrats and the mandate. Oh, gosh. Just doing stuff out of spite. You know, just between you and I, Ryan. <laughs> and everybody watching. No, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just, you know, I mean, 
I, I don't mind politics if it's done in a good way, sure. a great way. Like, what are the issues? What's the ideology? What's going on here? Yeah, how can we you fix know? this problem? Yeah. yeah. So I'm just saying that that mandate was the most ridiculous thing the Democrats could have ever done. Oh, yeah. They barely have the Senate. Yeah. They're going to probably lose the House, the Senate, and the election right. in 2024. The midterms are coming up next year. I'm just saying it doesn't make any sense to me that it's kind of like what Arafat did. He could have got Judea and Samaria. Right. He, stormed, he hit the table with his fist. He stormed out of the meeting because he didn't get quite what he wanted. Yeah. But he could have had so much doing Ehud Barak's, because uh, I read his memoir uh, during his, during yeah, his time in office. Yeah, 90% of the land that they don't have today. But see, the land for peace doesn't work. It's not biblical. No. So I'm only bringing this up because the salt is so important. Of course, he goes on to say that you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Right. See, we're Beit Tehillah. We yeah. got the big menorah out there. We got our church sign. We got the driveway. You know, we're like, here we are. Here, here it is, you know. What? And so God wants his children to be a light in a dark world. You know, it says in the beginning of one of the Gospels, I think it's Luke, that men love darkness more than light. Right. It does. It says oh, it in uh, John thank 1. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And, of course, I'd like to bring up my favorite book, Leviticus, real quick here. <laughs> Leviticus. I know. It, it, uh. it's got, here's the interesting thing, Ryan. Uh, we talk about darkness, right? Right. So God's really exposing a lot of things, is he not? Oh, absolutely. Now, I, I want to just share this real quick because it's about darkness and light. Um, but Leviticus is broken up into two parts. Chapters, of course, 1 through 17 is the way to God. Chapters 18 to 27 is the walk with God. Now, what's interesting is this. If we want to walk with God in chapter 18, it says forbidden sexual practices. So all these things are about incest and sins done in secret, in secret. or in darkness or behind yeah. closed doors. Yep. But God says, if you want to walk with me, you can't be hiding in the darkness and committing these sins. Yeah. Oh, that's deep. So, so once again, we are salt and we are light. So he says, hey, if you have these attributes of the Beatitudes of mercy and tears and transparent and honesty and all these things, and you'll be persecuted for righteousness sake, my righteousness. And then, of course, he says what? You're going to be salt and you're going to be light. Yeah. So think about it. It's not about a person going after the world and pointing out all things that are wrong in the world or the government. It's all the things that, that God is showing us to do as individuals in his kingdom that draws people in. Sure. So you could put up with anybody. You can deal with anybody. You know, like some people would, would, would you know, if they're, if they're like a type A personality or whatever, you know, or an alpha male, alpha female, whatever terms you want to use, you know, people would take them the wrong way, like flavor of salt, but they get the job done. Yeah. Now they got to do it in a better way, maybe. But it's like I've been approached by that. Like, gosh, these people, they're kind of bossy. And <laughs> and I go, but they get the job done. Yeah. Okay. You know, and they didn't call you names. They didn't, you know, demean you. But they, you know, they're, they're strong. Sure. But they get the job done. And that's why you got to have the type A person. You got to have those people in your ministry. Or you, or it'll be like Kumbaya, you know, Hare Krishna. Would, you know, <laughs> you won't get anything done. And you'll be like, oh, isn't this great? No, you didn't get anything done. Right. So, you know, uh, that's what I really appreciate about flavors, you know, like Baskin Robbins. You know, everyone's got a flavor. Every one of my children have a flavor, like personality tests and different things, you know. And I'm learning, like, what each child likes to do, what, what their interests are. Sure. Because, like I said, everyone listening, you have a flavor. That's right. You know, like Neapolitan, you know, that's a, that's a cool half gallon that's of ice cream. three flavors. You get three flavors for one. Yeah. One price, yeah. three flavors. See, like I like, um, what is it, Moose Tracks? Oh, yeah. Yeah, or Otter Paws. Rocky Road. Yeah, Rocky Road, I'm, eh. but but I like Moose, moose tracks, tracks and Otter Paws. And otter then they make paws. mint Moose Tracks now. Mint Interesting. Moose tracks. Yeah. You know, I saw this this milkshake they have at Chick-fil-A. It looks so good. They have this commercial about the little pieces <laughs> and chunks are so good. This is my favorite thing. And I thought, wow, they're really describing this mix. I, I, I almost got my car. Let's go get one of those things. So, like, what we're doing is... You know, we're we're promoting the Torah. Yeah. I gotta give me some Torah. Yeah. Or I gotta give me some gospel of Matthew, yeah. you know. And it's funny how this this Matthew thing has taken off well, with with if you look at uh, the character in the chosen. Oh yeah. My son did Godspell, which is based upon the Gospel of Matthew. Right. We're in Matthew and the Lord was showing me that God has a kingdom. Yeah. Are you kingdom minded? Are you in the kingdom? Right. And that's why we love the flavors. Yeah. Anything well, else? Oh well, I just I think that uh you know, it takes a lot of different things to put together that flavor. But the salt and the light are both, I mean, these are both similar things that we're talking about here, right? right? So you don't hide the light under right. under a bushel, right? You don't put it under a basket. What do you do with it? You put it on a lampstand so it brings light to everybody, which means that we don't hide Jesus. We don't put him in the back seat. We don't, 
you know, not use salty salt, right? That's right. The world needs these things. And what they're doing and what the darkness is doing is trying to push the light back. And what we've done is we've cowered and allowed that to happen, right? And that's not what we should be doing. What we should be doing is we should be standing on our faith on important subjects. What happens is the enemy gets us by distracting us with silly things, especially political yeah. things. And what we should yeah. be doing is focused on the mission. I was talking with somebody the other day, and I, I keep telling people this over and over and over again. No matter what happens out there in the world, what the distractions are, the mission, right? The Great Commission hasn't changed, right? It just hasn't. We're that's, supposed that's to be true. leading people to and Yeshua. we can be lazy in that area. Period. We can be lazy in that area. Well, it's just like people at work. Because we could be doing something as an individual— and not worried about, well, where are the numbers? Where are the people? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But we can still further the kingdom. We can still get ready. We can still prepare ourselves. That's right. Amen. But let me ask you this. So what will happen when God's children shine their light before men? When you shine your light before men, the people see it. They see your good works, Ooh. right? And then if you're doing it right and you're shining the light in the right direction, then they will glorify your Father in heaven because of the good works. You know, it's interesting that we, we still stay in contact with a lot of people that used to come here or know us, acquaintances or whatever. Sure. But they still call or contact or want something or need something or want to talk. Yeah. And I find it interesting that we still have that salt and that, that light. Yeah, amen. You know what I mean? Amen. Now, maybe they're not expressing their faith the way we are. Right. So Yeshua is the light of the world, and this is the light that we shine out of our life. Yeah. You know, are you a night light? Or a floodlight. Right. This is what it says in, in John eight twelve. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You know, light was created on the fourth day. Yeah. The day is the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. So when this reference of being a light, they were anticipating the Messiah to be a light to come, like the light of creation on the fourth day. God said, made, set, and saw yeah. those things up in the heavens. Uh, the sun, moon, and stars. But I find it interesting that it is so true that he sheds a light on it. Yeah, check this out. This is John 1, 1 through 5. It says this. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There you go. I mean, wow. I think that's some powerful what, stuff. What reference is that? That's John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. You know, and um, you know, it says in verse 8, He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which, the light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. So I mean it's it's just interesting how the light is the you know the life of men and that we carry the light. So we're light bearers, right? So he gives us the light and then we are supposed to shine. That's what he's talking about. We are. That's awesome. So this is kind of building up this particular uh, portion uh, that we've gone over as far as the outline goes. So Ryan, if you want to read Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, the Torah is relevant for today. Man. This is the icing on the cake. We're finishing up with this as, as, as our thought process ends. But but let's go ahead and read that. My title says Christ fulfills the law. There you go. And that's a whole other world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to get there. Oh, do you watch? I didn't have that in here, but you guys mentioned it. Oh, we're going we'll for it. We'll talk about it. That's the good thing we're about interjecting all these things. There's so much. There's so much. So, all right. So, ready? It says here, verse 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise or no means, by no means, pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jump in there, Ryan. Hit it. Huh. This huh. is it. Huh. Got my, Looks like we're going to go for an hour. My bull in a china shop. No, I'm going to try not to do that, but I will say this. So so what did uh, Yeshua come to fulfill? It says here the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. Yeah, I'm just looking at this word pleru real quickly. I just I didn't put this in the outline, but I think I'm going to add it later. It, it's to make replete, to cram, to furnish, to execute, to satisfy. 
You know, it's not like he he did it. Now it's done. No, right. Um, other know. other places I've read about Plaru talk about cause to abound, to fill full. So like you have the idea of a cup that you're pouring something into and it fills up to overflowing. That's right. Particularly to fill a vessel. That's the same word used. I, listen, you're, you don't. No, you take it. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you deserve. No, no, please, it. no. Go you. No, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing, but You're is, not it, going is, to. is it the same thing as the Gentiles being filled into it the It is. Jar? You already read it in the Romans Jews eleven twenty five. But that that's so powerful. Here's what I'm going to give you. Wow. So, so here's what's been told to us from the church, right? That's what I just read, right? The fullness is pleru. That's right. Of the Gentiles. It's pleroma. It's a different version. So what are you version. coming into? Those of you that are listening and watching, what are you coming into? That's is the right. road that you're on leading to God? Are you going to go in the jar with the Jews? Uh, interesting. Fill it up. That's right. See, this is why we got to come together. Wow. So I was reading um, a commentary on Matthew by Warren Wearsby a while back, and he gets to chapter 5, verse 17 through 20. And th- I don't know if this is a verbatim statement, but it's, it is at least a good paraphrase of what he said. He said this. He said, Jesus did not destroy the law by fighting it. He destroyed the law by fulfilling it. Well, it's the punishment for not keeping it he bore on the cross. So, he, but here's what people think. People think when you get to fulfill, the word in English has this connotation that I've fulfilled my obligation, now my obligation is done. Right. Right? So we could say this, when we're talking about documents or laws or things like that, you could say, you know, Donald Trump, the greatest president in evangelical history, right? He fulfilled the Constitution, now it's done away with. Right. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? That's a good point. It is. Good so, example. So you mentioned um, Romans 11.25. So I'm just going to uh, jump over there just for a quick sec, and uh, I want you guys to, to hear this, okay? So it says here, For I, did not des- I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles what, what verse has that? come in. That's chapter 11, verse 25 of Romans. That's right, Romans eleven twenty-five. So that's the word fullness. It's the word pleroma, which is a, just a different form of the word pleru. That's right. right? It's pleroma. Pleroma. So it's, it's very similar to pleru um, because it's the same word, just a different Yeah, because I'm looking form. at pleru here, and it says right here, Ryan, it says right here, it says uh, to fill a vessel. Right. Wow. Right. So check this out. Um, when we get to uh, Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verses, uh, let's start at 16. It says, That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Messiah may dwell in our hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Messiah which passes knowledge, that you may be filled... With all the fullness of God. What's that word? Is it pleroma? Pleroma. Pleroma. All right, I got another one for you, right? Let's go. Because you know what? We got to do this. Uh, Listen, Colossians. Icing on the cake. We, we got this. Colossians. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, is talking about, uh, you know, going back and forth with uh, philosophers and vain deceit and all that. Right. But verse 9 kind of culminates and it says this. It says, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is one of those key verses for, um, you know, just the deity of Yeshua. Well, let me ask you, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, this word fullness, do you know what word that is in the Greek? Pleroma. Pleroma! It is pleroma. And so, listen, that's just three examples that I've given. And in each example... The connotation of those words does not give you the idea that now that he is the fullness of the Godhead right. bodily, that now the Godhead is done away with, right? Or, for example, that uh, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God, that now that we're filled with all the fullness of God, that we're done away with. That's right. Or if you get to uh, the fullness of the Gentiles, that now that the Gentiles have come to their fullness, right. that they're somehow done away with. Good point. And so give us the incentive now, Ryan. The incentive for... No, I mean, let's move on to the incentive now to, to have the Torah, remember? Because you're going to read Matthew 5.19 now. I am going to read Matthew 5.19. So... Yeah, because so, that, that field is... We could stay there all day. I could. That I was could. good at references, though. Thank you. Thank you. So that means people need to fill this. You can't just sit around and talk about it. Well, the connotation it. is we that need to get Yeshua the came to bring it to maturity, to ripen, to shed full light on it, to give you a better understanding. That's right. Not to terminate it. That's right. 
So uh, give us the incentive. Here. Whoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whatsoever or whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called the great in the kingdom of heaven. So let's move quickly through this reference here because here's the thing. There's the incentive. Well, do you want to be called greatest or least? I want to be greatest. That's right. So guess what? Tor is relevant. That's right. That right there says it. So what will happen to those whose righteousness does not exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees? They will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's not good. Not good at all. Now, now, what comes to my mind is that these are man's commandments or man trying to do things versus the righteousness of Christ in him that Amen. we get to do things. And, the, and I think that's the indwelling problem that we of the Holy all Spirit. Conf- I think we could start out with the righteousness of Christ and end up in our own righteousness. Which is not good. No, because then we got to fix that. Yeah, because our righteousness is filtered. So the, 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 the Greek word for law is nomos. Right. And the first time that the word law or is used can be found in Exodus twelve forty nine. It's the Hebrew word Torah. It's a real word. Not nomos in the Greek, but it's Torah. Mm-hmm. And it means a precept or statute, especially the Decalogue or Pentateuch. Okay. First five first books five of the books. Bible. Now, here's where it gets to be very interesting, putting all this together to be filled, to fulfill, yeah. the incentive to do it. Uh, the word law comes from the Hebrew word yara, and it means the following, to flow as water, to rain, to lay or throw, especially an arrow, i.e. to shoot, to point out, as if by aiming the finger, to teach, direct, inform, instruct, and teach. I mean, I, I, I said it another, twice, teach, but anyway, as if by aiming the finger, mm-hmm. what was written with the finger of God? The Torah. And remember in Luke, I believe, in, 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 as he's doing some demonic warfare, he says, I cast out devils by the finger of God. Amen. Yeah. Because what does Torah do? It allows you to be obedient and instructions for your life mm-hmm. to get that disobedient spirit out, to get those spirits out, because now you're obedient and you're following the Torah, the teachings and instructions. And, it's go- and of course, we know that uh, it's relevant for today because it means teachings and instructions and shows us what sin is in 1 John 3, 4, I want to read that. So we know that it's teachings and instructions, but also the Torah shows us what sin is. Amen. And what is sin? So if you say the law has been done away with, then you have no, no way of keeping track of, well, what is sin? What's the, what's the, what's the textbook here for that? It says sure. this in 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Mm. So that's why we got to measure all this out. And this is where the enemy tries to come in and say, oh, you believe works for salvation and all that. No, it's not the point. We're justified by the finished work of the cross. Now we're being sanctified. Remember Hesed. Hesed. The, 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 the characteristic of the saved believer is Hesed, believing loyalty, allegiance to God. And I, you can't overstate this because the people that have that characteristic, it's not a question of whether or not we're, uh, oh, do we have to keep it or not? It's, those who are in covenant with God are obviously going to teach and keep his instructions. It just, that's what you do. Not because you have to, because there's some, you know, uh, obligation or you're capitulating to the requirements of a dictator, but because you're in a loving and believing relationship. We believe in God, and so we're loyal to him, and we keep his covenant. I mean, it's just how it works you know that's the thing now now as we put all this together i would just say this because we have two things that we want to share from this particular portion of scriptures but uh i tell you what got me was this ryan it's so simple first of all the beatitudes it's kind of like okay step one humble yourself have mercy have his righteousness yes okay and when you do that you're going to have flavor yeah light yeah and that is going to produce right the Torah to manifest. That's right. To walk in that yep. properly. Right. Because you're humble, merciful, peacemaker. And you, you have can't salt, really keep Torah without the light. I mean. Because that's what Yeshua says. He tells the Pharisees. He but tells think, them, don't, you do all this other stuff, but you neglect the actual weighty matters. I think, I think the humility is the key to everything. Yeah. But I agree. Uh, I, I would agree. just say, so what two points can be learned from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 20, Ryan? Ooh, all right. There's, well, a, there's a lot. There's a ton. You can actually put, tag some things together. I would That's say my main one would be Hesed. I would say wow. I really want people to understand that concept. Um, I would encourage them to go and find uh, the word study that Michael Heiser did. It's a podcast. His, his podcast is called The Naked Bible. Um, and I forget which episode it is, but it's a word study on, um, on Hesed. He did it, I think, late last year, probably around November or so. 
Um, but my second thing was this. It says that uh, those who are persecuted for righteousness inherit the kingdom of heaven, just like the poor in spirit. And so I was thinking that maybe those people are the same person, right? They're both inheriting the kingdom of heaven. And the poor in spirit are persecuted. And I think that that is the place where we should be. We should be found poor in spirit because we're so zealous for the kingdom that we're persecuted. Amen? Right. Um, And if you're not being persecuted in some way, shape, or form, then maybe you're not really doing it. Maybe you're not salty enough. Maybe you're not bright enough. Um, you know, I, I th- and I have to apply that to my own life. Um, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody else. I'm just saying that I think that, that we as believers could be a little saltier and a little brighter. You know, I would say, yeah, number one, be humble, merciful, a peacemaker, have flavor, and shine the light of Yeshua. Amen. Number two, the Torah is relevant for today. The Torah is relevant for today. God bless you. Why don't you pray us out? All right. Father, we just thank you for allowing us to take the Beatitudes and make them applicable to our life and our thank character you, traits, Father, that we want to be merciful. We want to be peacemakers. We want to have the righteousness of Christ, and we want to have salt and light, Father. And we know that the Torah is relevant for today, and uh, as we live it and teach it to others, we'll be great in the kingdom. And I pray for all this in Yeshua's name, and for those that are listening, that they would receive this as well, that everyone that's listening to this and watching this, they will be great in the kingdom. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, guys, if you want to reach out to us, you can email me at ryan at twopraise.net. Bless you guys. Have a great week.